But what I'd first like to do is just kind of give you an idea of what's out there. Some of the platforms that are available. And it, in my opinion, it's this part right here. So now we've got 2,800 genes. What do you do with that information, right? And it always kills me that these groups, they spend so much money on these studies, you know, they have to get the, the mice, they have to make the transgenics, they have to get the cell lines, you know, they have to get people to work on the projects, they have to get postdocs, and they cry because they're getting pushed so hard. And eventually you have this huge genomics, you know, study, and at the very end you give it all your data to a computer person that really doesn't understand the data, right? And this is the interpretation. It is my opinion that you all should be looking at your own data. And you can totally do it with this software that I'm gonna teach you with today. I have taught this to high school kids. I kid you not. And they get it, right? It's not that hard. It really isn't. And I'm gonna go over some of the basic math that kind of under underlies all of this. And the, the actual concepts underneath all this is very simple, okay? So how can we cut this data? And there's a lot of ways we can potentially cut this data. And I think the most familiar package that everybody's familiar with is these pathway miners, text miners, right? Um, has anybody used David, gene set enrichment analysis, string? Well, we're gonna use string today for this. Um, some of the commercial versions of this software, uh, we're gonna, basically I'm giving you access to correlation engine. Uh, anybody heard of ingenuity pathway analysis? Yeah, it's fairly popular. And then there's Pathway Studio. Uh, basically what a text miner is doing is all of these genes have a history and they have text associated with them, right? Gene A is in this pathway. It's in this part of the cell. It has this protein domain on it. What you're doing with text mining, and it, basically these texts are put there by experts. It's text that we assign to these genes. And so what we're looking for with these text miners is given a big list of genes, are there any pieces of text that are overrepresented in that list? And given that in information, maybe that particular, say, biological group is playing a role in my system. Where I think everything is going, and again, though, you know, pathways are my business. And I've spent a lot of time with pathways, and everybody loves pathways. But if you actually go and you look at some of these canonical pathways, they were developed about 20 years ago. And if you look at the references on these pathways, you know, there's like seven references from four groups and three different species. And they're the same references, not only for the mouse pathway, but the human pathway. Where I think all of this is going is these kind of networks, these custom built pathways. So what we're, you're doing with these network builders is you're grouping genes based on any interaction. And these can be, be based on text, and it can also be based on co-expression rates and the actual data itself. And that's what I really like, because that's what I think signaling is really going on in the cell. Um, some of the free uh, network builders, so today we're gonna use string, I'm gonna demonstrate um, the network builders with string, but they also have Cytoscape. Has anybody heard of Cytoscape before? No. It's uh, kind of, it's better if you have a, a pretty high level of computer skills, but Cytoscape's a great program. Um, some of the commercial uh, versions of this are IPA and uh, Pathway Studio. Has anybody heard of Elsevier, the publishing? Anytime you're trying to get a manuscript and you know you can't get it, it's behind a paywall, it's these jerks. <laughs> but given that, they have a lot of data, a lot of papers and, and research that they can draw from that other people can't. So they have a very big literature database. What you can also do is data miners. So a lot of the, these ter first two were kind of dependent on what people are saying about the data. Where I think bioinformatics is really going and going to explode is taking your data and comparing it to all the data that's out there. Right, so we're not only we're not looking for text now. We're saying, given this list of 2,800 genes, my gene list. What does it look like compared to all the gene lists that are out there that have been, you know, all the studies that that are in the databases? Um, some of the data miners, TCGA, you can use that. Um, Expression Atlas, that's free. That's from the European uh, uh, Consortium. Um, socialists make the best tools. <laughs> Capitalists make good weapons, but we're not shooting anybody today. So we're going to use. So I, I 
We also have GEO2R, which is the data analytics program for Gene Expression Omnibus. I don't really recommend using that one. It's kind of crappy. Uh, but some of the commercial uh, data miners are Correlation Engine. Again, we're going to use that today. And it has a, what I love about Correlation Engine is it's a Illumina platform. And the one thing Illumina is good at is data. So the nice thing is, the hardest thing to do is trust a database that they've processed the data correctly. And I trust that Illumina has processed their data. Not only that, is that they can get lots and lots of data. So we're going to actually use that to compare our gene list to everything that's out there. And then at the very end, you have clinical databases. And Bob kind of alluded to this. We looked at uh, Survival Express, you know, looking at taking clinical data connected to all this genomic data. Um, some other good places, TCGA, a lot of places are like feeding into that database. Uh, I think the Human Protein Atlas is a really good database to look at to see, you know, kind of what your gene is, you know, the clinical aspects of it. And then for today's at lesson, we're going to look at uh, Cohort Analyzer. And so that's the Illumina version of this, uh, uh, the clinical database. So before I do that, I just kind of want to explain, I, I think a lot of people don't really get pathway analysis. And it's very simple. So imagine that this is a pathway, and this is actually a pathway known to be associated with lung cancer. It's got 40 genes associated with this pathway. In my study, I do my t-test, I do my multiple corrections, I believe there's 152 genes that are changing in my system, okay? The reason why all this stuff works is we have a limit, limited number of genes to pick from. So what you can do is you can think of these 40 genes as pink balls in a sea of 25,000 green balls. If I get 152 draws from these 25,000 genes, what's the odds I get one pink ball, right? Probably not unusual. What happens now if I draw three pink balls? That doesn't necessarily happen by random chance. That's making me think that this pathway might be playing a role in my system. But this is really what happens in bioinformatics. See, I get seven. The odds of that happening are infinitesimal. Given this result, I would say that this pathway is playing a role in my system because I'm drawing more than I would expect. And this works for anything. Remember, we can assign, we can make these groups anything we want. We can make it a pathway. We can make it genes that are in a particular part of the cell. We can make this genes that are associated with a particular master regulator. All of this underlies everything. And the nice thing about this is we can use it to find things we don't even measure. And that's probably the most critical thing about bioinformatics is that the really important things that go on in your cell probably happen post-transcriptionally. If you think about it, so when I, when I look at cells, when I do transcriptomes, I hardly ever see P53 change or VEGF or TGF beta. These are very important things. What happens is you don't have time to make it. It needs that action right now. So what you do is you phosphorylate it, you remove an inhibitor, you translocate it to the nucleus, but you don't see it at the transcriptome level. What we can do, though, is we know what these things interact with. So in this example here, we have interleukin 1A. It's a cytokine. A lot of times it's, it's actually expressed in other tissues, and you're measuring its effect distally. So in, my, in this particular instance, in my gene list, I had 43 targets of interleukin 1A that came in my gene list. The odds of that happening by random chance are 2 times 10 to the negative 17th. Given this result, I would say interleukin 1A is probably playing a role in my system because it's affecting so many things in my transcriptome. But not only that, is that we know a lot about these master regulators in that anything with a orange line, it's known to in induce that target. Anything in red is going up. These two, with the blue line, interleukin 1A is known to inhibit. Anything in green is going down. The only thing that's not represented a more active interleukin 1A signature are these four. Given this result, I would say I'm very confident that not only interleukin 1A is playing a role in my system, even though I might not measure it directly, but I'm very, very confident it's more active. And that's huge, right? And we can do this for microRNAs. Oh, that's the math behind it. It's really simple. <laughs> You're like, yeah, 
sigma, whatever. <laughs> it is actually, it's really simple. But you know, a lot of these things, you know, microRNAs are small. You know, a lot of times we don't measure it on an RNA seq study unless you're specifically looking for that. We can find if my microRNAs, we know what they affect, what mRNAs they affect. If I see a bunch of genes going down, a particular microRNA is known to inhibit, I would say that that's probably playing a role in my system, right? We can also do it for chemicals. And I use this story a lot. <laughs> I was doing a clinical study and they had two groups and it was elderly men and I think they were doing a pulmonary hypertension study. And one group of elderly men could only be on the clinical drug and then they had this control group and basically they could be on anything except the clinical drug. MDs are the worst at planning uh, studies, except you guys, I'm sure you're really good. <laughs> so, you know, we had these two groups. I look, I couldn't find any signature of the drug itself, but I found another signature for a drug. What do you think that was between two groups? Elderly men can only be on the clinical drug and a bunch of elderly men that could be on anything but the clinical drug. What do you think the difference was? Flomax or something. Flomax? No, it was Viagra. <laughs> Basal dilators. I totally saw that. So I basically, that was one of the worst meetings I ever had. I had to go to this meeting. They spent like $100,000 on this like clinical study and I had to tell them that their drug got overshadowed by boner pills. <laughs> so <laughs> they're like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but again, we can see anything. Imagine everything leaves waves in the transcriptome. And that, imagine if you're standing in a pool and you throw a rock over your shoulder, right? I might not see where the rock goes, but if then I turn around, I can see the waves that that rock left and I can find where that rock is. We do the same thing in the transcriptome. Everything leaves waves, drugs. It used to be, it's not so much more anymore, but whenever I would look at young versus old, I totally see a cannabis signature in the young individuals. We know what these genes, you know, all these drugs, you know, we know what genes they affect. We can see their effects in the transcriptome. This is an example of a text pathway miner. This is David. Again, we're mining text. We're looking for over, uh, uh, overrepresented uh, biological units in the gene list. Does anybody use David? It's kind of a crappy program, but. Here's what I don't like about David. I, you know, a lot of these text miners though, don't take full change information. I think full change is very important, right? If your gene goes up and down in your system, that's important information to know. And David does not care about that, right? And that's something to think about. Uh, here's an example of a network builder. Again, this is Pathway Studio. What we're doing now is we're connecting all of this gene expression any way we can. And a lot of these programs, what they'll do is put these master regulators in there to connect the, the, the expression. Again, we might not measure it, but I bet it's playing a role in my system because it has so many connections in the transcriptome. And data mining, again, you can look, I think Expression Atlas or the Human Protein Atlas is, is a great place to look. What I actually, I found, they actually have single cell um, signaling, or, uh, uh, single cell studies, sequencing studies, and I found one that kind of represented what we were looking at today, RNA-seq analysis of diffuse neoplastic infiltrating cells at the migrating front of human glioblastoma. What I did was, so here are all the clusters of genes, each dot represents an individual cell. What I did was I took one of our genes that were overexpressed in the macrophages and basically looked at where that gene was expressed. You can see these little dots here. Those are probably macrophages that have infiltrated that tumor. And then the clinical databases, Human Protein Atlas is a great place to look. Again, unlike the Survival Express, what it'll do, it'll separate on media separation and it'll give you a best separation as well. So, it, so what you did with Bob, the Survival Express basically just took the, all the gene expression and just kind of cut it in half and made the groups. Here they can, they'll actually optimize it for you. So you'll see that separation. All right, well, let's get started.